checks down. Andy Posda is with us now. He was nominated to be Labour Secretary, so and you didn't make it. My question is, Andy, were you the victim of vicious attacks from the left? Well, there were there were vicious attacks from the left, not only in the press, which was uh, which was really horrible the way that they dealt with the stories and dealt with the truth. But we also had, uh, there was an envelope left at my house addressed to my wife that had white powder, a paper doll with a noose around its neck and a pink sheet of construction paper that said Trump on it. Uh, we ended up with guys in hazmat suits at our house that night and the, uh, an FBI um, terrorist task force. Now, none of that got covered in the press at the time, uh, but it was, uh, it, it was quite a big deal in our neighborhood. So, it, yeah, there, there, was a, there were a lot of those kinds of things. That is just outrageous. But, look, thank you very much for sharing that with us, Andy, because I was sure. not aware of that in the background, not aware of it. I want to move on to President Trump's proposal. It's a budget proposal, which allocates $90 million in grants, grants for apprenticeships. Now, that doesn't seem to me like a whole lot of money. What do you say? It's about what, it's about what Obama was going to spend. President Obama's administration, Secretary Perez, were going to spend on apprenticeships. But the important thing isn't how much the government spends. It's how effectively the government spends it. What we need to do, and I, what I think uh, Alex Acosta will do, and I know the president, Reid Cordish, Ivanka Trump are all behind doing, is coordinating more with the private sector so we can make those dollars go further. It's really the, the private sector that needs to engage in apprenticeships, uh, internships, vocational training, to try and fill the jobs that they have where they can't bring pe they can't find the people yep. to fill the jobs. So it, it's not the amount of money that's spent. I think it's how they're going to spend that money in coordination with the private sector. I think it can work. I think it can be very effective. Well, I think that's the important factor. If these, these uh, training schemes are run by the companies which will ultimately hire these youngsters with the skills, that's a very, very different thing from pumping government money into government-run yep. technical training schemes, which actually have a very low achievement record, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there was a study in 2012 that showed that the achievement record of these federal programs was very low. And look, the private sector, they know where the jobs are. They know what skills they need. They're anxious to get people to fill those positions. Why not take the federal dollars, spend them in conjunction with the private spec sector to make them far more expansive so that they're worth a lot more? It's, this isn't about empowering government. It's about creating jobs for Americans. There are a lot of jobs out there. We just need to get the people um, who need those jobs, trained in the skills that the jobs require, and then we can start seeing labor participation rates go down, which are about, yeah. the, only, about the only economic indicator that hasn't significantly improved so far. And it is also a way of plugging the skills gap without leaving youngsters saddled with 30, 40, 50, 60,000 bucks worth of debt. Very good point. You don't have the expense, not only do you not have the expense, of a college education and the incredible amount of money now that you have to bar borrow, particularly at the better schools, but you actually get paid while you're going through an apprenticeship. So you, you will have some income. It's not going to be the kind of income you'll have once you're through the program, but you get paid and you don't incur debt. So this is, it's a positive in all respects. And we need to change the president getting behind this and his daughter getting behind it really should change the attitude in America about these jobs. There's jobs in welding, there's construction jobs. These are there are jobs in manufacturing. There are, even though the number of manufacturing jobs has come down in the United States, the number of openings in, in manufacturing positions has actually increased. So we need to get people so they want those jobs, they understand they're out there, they understand they're, they're good paying, and that there's honor in every job and yes. there's dignity in Precis every job. Precisely. Quit looking down on people who work with yep. their hands. Thank you very much. Andy Posda, thanks for joining us, sir. Always appreciate it. Glad to be here, Stuart. Yes, Thank you. The man who shot Congressman Steve Scalise left a string of anti-Republican messages on his Facebook page saying it's time to destroy President Trump. Question? Could Facebook have caught these posts and prevented the tragedy? More Varney after this. <laughs> Fill the screen. Oh. Ashley Webster, Elizabeth McDonald, Elizabeth punch. Peake, Andy Posda, and Scott Martin, and moi. Here we go. We're <laughs> off. We are running. Okay, uh, Scott, to you first. Is this the start of a new drop for the overall market? What do you say? 
Well, I don't think a new drop, Stuart. I actually think this is a continuation of some of the selling pressure we saw last Friday, which was really an amazing day when you looked at the volume and the fervor that was going into some of these selling orders on Friday afternoon. So to me, this is a repricing. This is a, a general pullback. I don't think this is the big contraction everybody's looking for. But let's face it. Uh, you talked with Scott Sheldy on Monday about this on the show, because I watch it even when I'm not on. Thank you very much. <laughs> and he talked about these weak hands, you know, this cheap money that was in some of these names. And he's absolutely right. These are very weak hands that have come to these tech stocks of late. These are the hands that are getting out, not the long-term investors, because if you are one, you should stay in these names. Uh, Liz, start of a big drop for the market. What say you, Liz Peak? I, I don't think so, because basically investors have still no place else to go. And rates are moving up slightly, but yields are obviously incredibly low. Mm. Interestingly, their, their recent survey showed that a lot of uh, investment professionals think the market's overvalued. But the number two thing they think overvalued is European stocks, which is sort of a shock, but it just goes to show that there really aren't a whole lot of opportunities out there where we have growing markets. And so far, it's all about the Trump agenda. I think investors are looking at what's going on in Washington. They're kind of horrified by all the assaults on Donald Trump. But if there is any indication we're going to get stuff moving forward, the market will be just fine. Mm. Quickly, Andy Posda, do you see this as the start of a big drop or what? No, we've had there have been 37 records set by uh, by the the Dow since November. There's been 46 records by Nasdaq. We've had three quarter percent interest rate hikes during that period of time. You remember back in 2016, we had one quarter percent income uh, interest rate hike, and the stock and the market dropped 600 points. We're not seeing that kind of drop. The economy's strong. The indicators are strong. And Liz is right. If we can get uh, the Trump agenda going, we're going to be in great shape. Let's get back to the big tech names. We've followed them for a long, long time. And why not? They've gone straight up until now. Now we've got a decline in Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, Alphabet, Netflix. All of them are down in the very early going. Scott Martin, you look at the price of these big tech names. Are you in interested in buying any of them on this dip? Yeah, I look at the price, Stuart, I get pretty excited. I mean, Amazon below 1,000 again, Google below 1,000 mm. again, and even maybe even 950 by the end of the day here today is attractive because the reality is when you look at these tech companies, Stuart, that we talk about every Thursday and you talk about them on other days without me, thank you very much, uh, you know, these are, stock, these are stocks that are really not terribly expensive. If you, if you look at the growth that you're seeing in these stocks today and the projected growth that the Googles, the Microsofts, the Facebooks are going to have in the next couple of years, that's why you're buying these stocks for the future growth, the future pricing potential these stocks have. So I still would own them and I would still be collecting them as far as shares here. All right. I've owned Microsoft for a couple of decades. Uh, I've not sold yet. OK, <laughs> check the big board. This is not a huge decline at this point. 53 points down, that is exactly a quarter of 1%. Yeah. How about the S&P 500? What's the percentage drop there? It's down 0.55%. OK, that's a half percentage point, yeah. 13 actual points. Still not a huge decline. Look at Xerox. They've just uh, completed a reverse stock split. That's where shareholders get one share, new share, for every four old shares that they own. Xerox now down a fraction on that, but it's at 27. Nike, cutting 2% of its workforce, announced a, an organizational restructuring. Don't know what that means, but the stock's down a buck 50. <laughs> Morgan Stanley says Tesla should <clears throat> brace for serious competition from Apple in driverless cars. Mm. OK, but let me back away from this story for a second. Liz, Peake, I, Liz, I can't believe the amount of interest and attention driverless cars are getting. The amazing thing to me is how fast it's moving. And yes. what we see is both traditional automakers and every tech company in the world looking at this as a huge new opportunity. So is Tesla going to face competition in driverless cars? Without a doubt, there were 30 different organizations that filed permits for testing driverless cars in April. They're not all names we've heard of, but that is an amazing uh, sort of surge in interest here. Yeah. And why? Because this is a huge industry. And to the extent yeah. that you can jump ahead of traditional but, automakers but, with mm. new technology, wow, what an opportunity for uh, Google, for I Apple, and point, everybody. But hold on a second. Yeah. We're miles away from yeah. the regulatory legal framework right. which will allow the mass right. production and use of autonomous cars. And we, you know, the consumer demand as well. It would take city zoning to have separate lanes and areas for driverless cars. The driver driverless truck 
the uh, captainless ship, robot ships, that's where this could go. That's where the corporate world can make a lot of oh. money off of that. So what's we'll talking airplanes yeah. too? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. An airplane. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you they, know, they talked oh. Stuart. They talked about airplanes too. I mean, they talked about the, the the pilotless airplane as well being the wave of the future because these are this automation takeover that we're seeing. Emac made a really good point. You know, this <laughs> technology, so as far as the fervor for it, feels a little bit ahead of itself because there's a lot of changes regulatorily that need to happen before yeah. all those but cars are going to get on the road. Do you remember the joke? way back when mm -hmm. in the computer-driven planes and a voice comes over the loudspeaker and says, nothing can go wrong, go wrong. <laughs> go wrong. <laughs> I digress, I digress. Put another quarter in the, uh, in the, in the bottle there. Yeah. Speaking of airlines, listen to this. Here's a statistic for you. Airline passenger complaints jumped 70% in April from the year before. April, of course, was the month when we had the dragging incident on United. But uh, i got to say, uh, Andy Posner, the stock prices of the, of the airlines, despite this passenger complaint level, went to record highs. What's going on? Well, there's a lot of business out there. People are traveling. The economy is surging. People are going all... You know, and just to touch on your car thing for a moment, one thing didn't get mentioned was that Ford just put its IT guy, its tech guy, in his CEO of the company. This is a big search. But back to airlines, look, there, there's a lot of business. Everybody's traveling. And I think people now feel empowered to complain after these incidents yeah, got so do. much attention. And well, rewarded for you're it. Right, yeah. you're right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yes. It's also That's monotonous. Right. And rewarded yeah. for it. Half of those people yeah. are hoping for a gigantic settlement that'll solve their life problems. <laughs> Exactly. Ask, right. ask for a complaint and you yeah. shall That's receive. Right. Fly yeah. the unfriendly skies. Also, That's let's not forget on the airlines, oil prices are down, and generally and, speaking, that has been a and, mo and monopoly helps. pricing. We have to yeah. say that as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, on this program earlier this week, we Ooh. talked about Lidl, the German grocery chain, Lidl. coming to America. Well, they're here. They're opening stores, plural, in North Carolina today. Mm. Should America be worried, Scott? I'm thinking of the WalMarts of this world, because Lidl is a fierce competitor on price they are uh, Stuart you know it's gonna be interesting they're gonna try to open about a hundred stores here in the United States over the next a year year and a half and you know there's probably some decent competition to come now it's it's an interesting store it's small they're only gonna have about six to seven aisles per store specialty type items they're gonna have a lot of specials with respect to pricing so it, to me, you know, the grocery store business is really tough because pricing is so competitive these days, you know, whether it's Whole Foods or yeah. Kroger's and those guys. So the reality is it's not a great space, but given the fact that they do have kind of this edge with respect to these specialty pricing offers, yeah. I think that's an interesting play here. It could be as disruptive as Costco and Walmart Sam's Clubs were in the 90s and the early part of last decade mm. in terms of what Lytle's doing. That's who, according to economist Edgar Denny. So the cheap, cheaper quality goods. And That's what the, it's a time for good food. Very, very popular. Nah. Well, all Doesn't these growing to too. It's not, it's not just little. Of... You've got Aldi on there as well. Pie in the face. So, uh, well, hold on a second, no, I... <laughs> Andy Posta, Say that again. I, I missed you. What did you say? You say you've got you've got Aldi growing too, which is a, comp a competitor yes, with yeah. little. Actually, I was on the show with you last yep. week when this came up, and I went to see if I could buy little stock. It turns out it's privately held. Oh, but yeah. it may, <laughs> apparently it may. But it, the, the belief is it'll help. It'll help other. Brands like Dollar General, because people may yeah. go to these millennials aren't so tied into brands as uh, older generations were. So it may help other companies. You see how on the ball we are? Yes. We talk about the retail ice age and cover it thoroughly. And then there's a, some no, new bricks and mortar people coming to America. We cover it thoroughly. Yeah. You know why? We've worked on top of Amazon as they just, we are really we are good. Great. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Liz Peake, Andy Puzder, Scott Martin, yeah. thank you one and all. Crowded Pleasure. screen, well now.